with knowledge. Before the discovery of vaccines, hundreds and thousands of people were dying from these vaccine-preventable diseases like tetanus, polio, measles, rabies, and so on. And it was because of this great number of deaths that pushed scientists to discover something that would prevent them in the first place. Vaccines. Vaccines have contributed so much to public health. Since their discovery, the number of deaths from these illnesses has gone down from 0.9 million in 2000 to 0.4 million in 2010. We no longer see smallpox. Nobody's aware of smallpox anymore because of the smallpox vaccine. For polio cases, the number of cases has gone down by 99%. And it's exactly because of this uh, reduced number of illnesses that we no longer see these illnesses, that we've forgotten the gravity of these diseases. We've taken them for granted. We've become so, so in our comfort zones. To add to this, there's an increasing number of anti-vaccine groups that have come up, which spread false and terrifying news about the harmful effects of vaccines. So it's no wonder that vaccine confidence has gone down so much. So let's review some myths and misconceptions about these vaccines. Myth number one, vaccines can cause autism. Andrew Wakefield, a British ex-physician, uh, first published a paper in 1988 claiming that uh, there was a connection between autism and the measles and mumps rubella vaccine. However, upon investigations, it was found that he falsified data and he had multiple conflicts of interest. So later on, his paper was recanted from the journal and his license was revoked as well. To date, no evidence has found a connection between autism and childhood vaccines. Studies have identified symptoms of autism in children even before they received MMR vaccine. And even more recent research has shown evidence that autism develops in utero, meaning even before the child was born or has received any vaccination. Myth number two. Vaccines contain harmful chemicals like toxins. As a matter of fact, vaccines do contain multiple ingredients like antigens, preservatives, stabilizers, which are proven to be safe and effective when used correctly and in very small amounts. These chemicals are needed in order to improve the immunogenic effect of the vaccine to prolong its potency, and even to inactivate or kill viruses or bacteria in the vaccine. However, these vaccines contain very, very small amounts of these chemicals. In fact, the US FDA states that there's 50 to 70 times higher formaldehyde that you can find in a baby's blood when compared to a vaccine. Further, comparing it to a pear, which contains 12,000 micrograms of formaldehyde, a vaccine only contains 0.83% of that amount. So it's that small. Myth number three, flu vaccines can cause the flu and they don't work. The flu vaccines have been around worldwide for over 60 years now and they've been proven to be safe. However, you need to get a flu shot every year because flu viruses are constantly changing. So the WHO revises the formulation every year. So you have to update your flu shot every year. So it's the wet season, guys. Are your flu shots updated? Yes. Very good. Okay. So furthermore, it's a misconception that th these flu vaccines can cause the flu because the flu vaccine contains an inactivated or a killed virus already, so it doesn't produce disease. Myth number four, natural immunity is better than immunity gained from vaccines. Well, some people may argue that immunity gained from a natural infection is way better than immunity from vaccine, 
the risks associated with a natural infection is far greater than the risk of immunization for any recommended vaccine. For example, if you choose to acquire measles from a natural infection, then you face a 1 in 500 chance of dying from the symptoms, like pneumonia, that's the number one cause of death. When comparing it to the chances of getting a severe allergic reaction to the MMR vaccine, it's only less than one per one million doses. So it's that low. Myth number five. A child can actually get the disease from the vaccine. While well, vaccines do cause symptoms, mild symptoms, uh, which resemble those of the disease they're protecting against. So for example, fever or body fatigue. But these symptoms do not necessarily signal an infection. In fact, in this small percentage of reactions that do occur, it's actually your body's way of mounting an immune response, of developing antibodies to the vaccine and not the disease itself. So vaccines have been in safe use for over decades now. And like what Doc maybe said, They've undergone years and years of clinical trials before they get marketed and they obtain licensure for use. But here's the thing. Scientists have learned that even long ago, just simply presenting these facts to parents is not enough for them to simply change their minds. Our brains are just not wired that way. Emotion, uh, our decisions are mainly emotional, not logical. We can relate. <laughs> so what's a possible solution to vaccine hesitancy? Beyond busting myths and presenting all these facts, fostering vaccine confidence among parents will entail engagement. We need to replace fear and, and the judgment of parents with vaccine fears with knowledge and understanding of these parents. Because if one feels heard and understood, then they let their guards down. We also need to reach out to as many parents as possible in order to let them realize that they need to spread the word about how vaccines are safe and effective to use so that herd immunity will be up. It's our responsibility to ourselves, our families, our children, and to the world. Because at the end, beyond facts and figures, the best way to communicate to vaccine hesitant parents is to help them let go of their fears. To help them realize that vaccines save lives through thoughtful communication, empathy, and compassion. So again, the mantra for today, be a vaccine advocate. <laughs>